Welcome to the second lecture for regulatory frameworks for environmental management and planning. So in this lecture, we're going to do the first of three lectures looking at the planning framework in Queensland. So today, we are going to look at planning schemes. Next week, we'll look at the development assessment system in more detail. And the week after that, we'll look at conditions and development uh, offences. So it's a complex system. And I want to try and unpack it for you in a logical way that doesn't drown you in detail right from the start. So I'm going to try and unpack it over these next three lectures. And then we're also going to be uh, working on the development assessment system for the group assignment. And that will hopefully really embed a lot of the complex concepts that probably will seem, to start with, will seem abstract and just weird. Uh, but hopefully that will embed them in a real working knowledge for them for you so that you'll actually understand what is a material change of use and the sort of terminology. There's a whole jargon in this area. So today, what we're going to do is look at a real uh, problem. Uh, I'm calling it the Tornamini Development Application. It was a client of mine about 10 years ago who gave permission for me to use it in lectures. So that's useful because I can go into a lot of the background documents and talk to you about what was proposed and how it was assessed in a way that uh, I couldn't get from just like choosing a, um, you know, a make-believe example. So this is a real example I'm going to use in these lectures, real-world examples, so authentic problems, and we're going to base our the lectures around problem solving, just like the whole course is based around problem solving. So today's problem is the Tornabini development application, and broadly, what we're going to ask in this lecture are this big question, does the proposed development application comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to make it comply? And that's a core question that you will regularly have in professional practice, whether you're a planner, an environmental manager, uh, an engineer, environmental scientist working in the development sector or in government, and you're looking at an activity, your core question is, well, do we comply with the law what we're proposing to do or what we're actually doing? And if not, how do we make it comply? And what we'll see is one of the main systems that we use, one of the main frameworks we use, is to require things to have get a government approval, and then it's assessed against a range of criteria. So that's the so you make something unlawful unless it has government approval, and then there's an application process to essentially get that approval, and then it's a lawful activity. So within that broad question, we're going to unpack that and ask three subsidiary questions. Well, what laws regulate this activity? Are there any applications needed to gain government approval? And then are those applications likely to be granted? And within those, we'll have a couple of sub-questions as well. Okay, so for the what laws regulate the activity, well, we're gonna ask, where do I find the law? Because I wanna start with some building blocks for you. Many folk come to this course without any background in the law. So let's go and have a look at where we find the law and then how do we interpret it? And then in relation to the applications needed to gain government approval, I'm going to focus on the Planning Act and particularly the triggers under the, the planning scheme, the local government planning scheme. So the third sub-question then, are these applications likely to be granted? Because we'll find it requires approval and you assess it against the planning scheme and uh, essentially we'll find that it complies with the planning scheme, therefore it's likely to be approved. And that's the basic test for applications. I just want to mention the field trips at the end of the lecture. Okay, so before I turn to the problem though, can I just deal with three preliminary topics? And the first is this. Years ago I was, I'm not a huge tennis fan, um, but I was watching a tennis match uh, randomly, and one of the uh, commentators said the Champions do the basics well. And I thought about it and it's always st stuck with me because if you think about it, a champion like Roger Federer, you know, they, they can serve really well, they can volley really well, they can do forehand and backhand really well. So all those things that, you know, if you know how to play tennis, you can also do those things. Uh, and to become a proficient tennis player, you need to do all those basic things. And then a champion does all those basic things and then they take it to a whole next level. But, you know, if someone like Roger Federer, if they didn't um, do forehand well, then their opponents would quickly work that out and all they would be playing would be forehands because that was their weakest shot. So unless you do the basics well, you're not going to be a champion. And 
in your professional careers, that's also relevant because you know you need to be able to do the basics well. And if you're a if you're working in the development assessment system, you need to be able to do some basic statutory interpretation. You can't be a town planner unless you can interpret a planning scheme. Like you just can't do your job. So that's statutory interpretation. So there are a range of basics that we're going to cover in this lecture that are the building blocks for success in your careers. A second thing that I just want to mention is an explanation of the structure of these lectures because I'll tell you, years ago I did a law degree and lived through it. It was the worst experience of just about my life. It was so boring. I was doing science and law and science was so much fun, you know, lots of great slides of butterflies and, you know, I was doing a biology degree, ecology degree. And then I'd walk across from, um, was it the Goddard building, the science building in the Great Court, uh, across to, it is Goddard, isn't it? The science building, yeah. And then I'd walk across to Fulgan Smith where most of the law lectures were held. And there'd be these terrible lectures from law lecturers with a whole heap of text, no pictures. And you know, you'd, you'd, you'd walk into a lecture and they'd say, we were halfway down the, your study guide at page 42. We were talking about the principles of equity the principles of equity are X, Y, and Z. And then you go on to two hours of torture. Um, so the traditional lecture plan, I think, is sort of like this, topic one, topic two, topic three. And I found it incredibly boring. Uh, but then when I started working as a lawyer, I actually found it really interesting, the law really interesting. And I thought, what was the difference? You know, I hated it as a law student, and I'm really loving it as a lawyer. What's the difference? And I came to realise that the difference is when you're in professional practice, you are solving people's problems. And it is that pro it's the enjoyment you get out of and the focus you get out of solving problems that actually is really interesting. And the law then is just a component of how you do it. So the principles of equity, like in a lecture, might be really boring. But if they are the difference between your client you know, getting a million dollars or not, then those principles of equity become really interesting. And if you're going to court, you know, and someone's going to yell at you if you don't understand, you know, then they become also really interesting and you sweat a lot and you spend lots of late nights um, doing things. So problem solving, I think, is what makes the law really interesting and also professional practice. And so what I want to do in our lectures is always start with a problem. We're going to look at a real world problem and say, okay, here's a set of facts. And then I'm going to deal with similar topics that I would deal with if I was just doing an abstract lecture, because I think the, the key problem with a lot of lectures is they're abstract from the real world, whereas in professional practice, you're always problem solving. You're solving you know, someone's issues, your client's issues, and that's what makes application interesting. So we start with a problem, and then what I'm going to do is relate back. So we'll start with a problem, go through a series of topics, and then relate it back to the problem at the end. And I'm hoping that you find that an interesting approach. I certainly worked, I work on this approach because I just think it is, uh, I have a little saying that all law is boring until you try and apply it to solve a problem. And that's when it becomes really interesting. So we're going to be, in this course, we're going to be focusing on the law in application and that's very much what your group assignments are about and the whole structure of the course and you'll see when we get to the exam it's all about problem solving so all of the questions are given a little set of facts what is the you know what is the legal consequences of this set of facts so it's all about problem solving hopefully training you for your professional careers because you as professionals have to be good problem solvers uh, good professionals are good problem solvers you know you don't for instance if you, you don't go to a doctor you know, if you've got a fever and let's, you know, if you've got a fever and you're sweating and then you probably shouldn't be in this lecture room uh, to start with. But if you did, you know, you go along to a doctor, you ring them up and say, I've got a fever and I'm sweating and they'd send around a van to pick you up and put you in a little, you know, cocoon, take you off to some isolation unit. But um, what you really want to know from the doctor is, you know, do I have coronavirus or, you know, do I just have a headache? Do I just have the normal flu? You don't want them to tell you about the sort of the theories of you know, infectious diseases or the like. You want them to diagnose you and tell you whether, you know, what you've got and then give you some medication to make you well. So you want them to solve your problems. You don't want to know all the background, all the theory about 
medical practice and the like, you want them to solve your problem. The same with you. When you're working, people come to you to solve their problems. They don't come to you to be told, you know, oh, theories about planning or theories about you know, environmental management or something or theories about engineering. They come to you to solve their problems. So that's what we focus on in this course. So, yeah. Make it interesting and make it real world. Okay, the other thing I just wanted to mention is a legal problem solving method. I just mentioned this really briefly because it might, um, lawyers use this a lot. It's called the ISAC. There's another acronym called ARAC. Uh, it's basically identify the issue, state the law or identify the law for that issue, authority for the law, apply the law to the facts and reach a conclusion. And that's what you regularly do uh, in basically solving legal problems. So if your client comes to you and says, I want to do this development, your question might be, well, uh, if it's accessible development, you need an approval under the Planning Act. So that's the law. Then authority for the law might be a section of the Planning Act. And then you apply the law to the facts. So you go and look at the planning scheme, you look at relevant other bits of the law, you find out whether what they're proposing is accessible development or not. You apply it to the facts and you reach a conclusion. Yes, you need a development application. You need an approval for this. So that's essentially the legal problem solving method. Uh, as I say, ARAC is another acronym that's commonly used, issue, rule, authority, uh, sorry, issue, rule, uh, apply and reach a conclusion. So that's just all background. Let's look then at the problem. So our problem today is a unit development at Northgate. So I'm deliberately going to make this a really simple but common example. So last week we looked at the Adani mine, you know, big lots of whistle, bells and whistles, complicated science involved. And in some lectures we'll look at complicated problems. But in others like this, I really want to use a relatively simple, common, everyday example to unpack the key issues because these are the sorts of things that you will face in your early professional careers. You'll be looking at, you know, someone comes in, you say you're a planner, you're working for a consultancy, a client comes in and says, I want to, I've got you know, land at Northgate and I want to put some units on it. Uh, you, you know, your manager says, OK, will you prepare the development application for them? Or you know, check out if they need a development application, you prepare it. So that's the sort of thing you do early on. You're not working at you know, some massive big project by yourself. You'll start with smaller projects and be under guidance of more experienced people. So this site that we're looking at is at Northgate. So anyone live in Northgate? Catch the train or the bus in, no one here? Okay, so Northgate on the north side of Brisbane, so about 20 kilometres north of where we are now. So if we focus in on that, and uh, you can see there, um, I've got a circle around the site, obviously, but what can you tell me about the surrounding area, straight off? Just, you know, everyone's look at Google Earth. What's around it? Industrial. industrial, so that's in this section here, isn't it? Everyone agree that looks like industrial? So industrial up there. Okay, so pick out something else. Creek line. Yep, coming through here. Everyone agree that's creek line? Big, long, straight. So it was a creek and it's been basically turned into a drain. Uh, anything else that you can spot? Sorry? Residential? Yep, so all of these little things are pretty obviously, you know, residential houses. What about this big thing going here? Arterial Road, not quite. It's actually the train line going north. So that's the branch where one goes to Sandgate and one goes to Caboolture. So if you ever caught the train to Caboolture, that's where you turn off. Um, and, and obviously a range of roads. What about over here, this big sort of green patch? Yeah, it's some playing fields. I think there's a the, uh, Catholic university there. Is, it's basically an educational institution. And basically you've got this um, you know, common sort of image for a city like Brisbane with a whole range of things spread across the landscape. Okay, so if we focus in, you can see that creek more clearly and you can see the houses. And then on the other side of the creek is the industrial area. And the land that we're developing, so let's say we're, we're acting for our client is the proponent, so um, Mr. Tornabini, and he's, an, he's 
family has owned two blocks of land for a long time. These are the two blocks. Uh, so big parcels of land. He owns them. Small scale developer, so not you know some massive developer that's going in doing you know 100 lot subdivision. This is just a small uh, material change of use. To, he wants to change houses into units. So he wants to have 10 units. So just going to clarify something. So that's if you're looking at it on Google Earth, you normally look at it with north to the top. So what I'm going to do is turn the image uh, anti-clockwise. So see what I've done? I've turned it around. So anti-clockwise 90 degrees. And I want to do that because the maps I'm going to show you are in this orientation. So looking at that in Google Earth, this is the two lots that we've got. So in tutorials last week, we talked about lot and plans, to, and they're very useful. So in Queensland, we have the Torrens uh, system. So that was developed by a fellow called Torrens in South Australia um, over 100 years ago. And essentially what you used to do if you owned land, if you wanted to sell it, you had to prove a chain of title. And that meant you had to basically show uh, contracts from when it was originally granted all the way through to be able to sell the land. And it was a really ripe area for fraud. So um, people could manufacture documents and it was ripe for fraud and difficult to, for, a, for someone buying land to actually know if the person selling it owns it or not. So if you're going to you know, pay someone a million dollars for the land, uh, then you want to know that they actually own it because you don't want to hand over a million dollars and then you know, move into the house and suddenly the owners show up from holidays and they say, what are you doing in our house? And you say, well, I own it. And they say, no, you don't. We own it. And you've been defrauded, but you've handed over your million dollars and they're not at fault. So how do you, how do you know when you buy land that who's the person selling it to you actually owns it. So what Torrens did was basically create a system where there's a central land registry and then the basic principle is indefeasibility of title. Uh, whoever's registered on the land registry is the owner at law. And uh, if there's fraud in who's registered, well, there's a system set up where people can be paid, but basically that central registry is the key fulcrum for the whole system. So that system's been widely adopted around the world. So folk who come from overseas, you may well have a similar system with a central land registry where everything is you know, on this central database that people can search. So a typical thing that if you're buying land and you engage a, you engage a lawyer to do the conveyancing for you is they will do a search of the land registry and make sure that the person who is selling it to you is the registered owner and only then do you hand over the money. So that's the basic thing that's done. I'm, I'm doing quite a bit of work up in Papua New Guinea at the moment and it's a completely different system of most land is still under customary land tenure and so I'm working on an island where there is no, re there is no real maps of who owns what. There's, I'm working in an area with about, about 30,000 people and there's no, like the people on the ground know where their land boundaries are but there's no way you can just go and search for it and know that who owns what. And it's very, very complicated to determine ownership. So the Torrens system is a big deal. And each parcel of land, so when land is first um, sold by the government, uh, it might be a big parcel. And as it's basically broken up, or what's traditionally been called subdivision, so breaking up, like originally it was a big parcel of farming land, that was sold by the government uh, and then it's broken up over time as the city develops. So as it's broken up, uh, registered surveyors can prepare registered survey plans that are lodged with the central registry and you have to be a registered surveyor to do one of those and they give it essentially the RP, so registered plan is what it stands for. There's other uh, letters that are used, SP and a range of other things, but RP is one of the classic ones, registered plan 34599. And then it's bro as it's broken up, there'll often be um, the lot, individual lots will be given a lot one on that registered plan. So 
each parcel of land has an individual or unique identifying combination of lot and plan. So if you have the lot and plan, it's really useful for doing a lot of searches in a whole range of uh, land related um, databases. Can use the uh, street address, but also they will have the lot and plan, and the lot and plan is a lot more useful often. Uh, we saw in the tutorials last week for the uh, samurai property, it's seven parcels of land and to, it's all owned by the one family and it's a big pastoral property but it's seven parcels of land. So the street address doesn't really tell you the boundaries of that property. You really have to know the lot and plan descriptions to work it out. Okay, so they're the two lot and plans that our client Peter Tornabini owns. And so this is the existing site plan. Okay, so you can see the two lots in outline. And what Peter wants to do is put 10 units on it. So I'll just go back. Here's the existing houses. See them there? I'll just go back one more time. So here's those two existing houses. This was a disused chook shed out the back. Um, so they're the two existing houses. And this is what he wants to do, put 10 units on it. Now, you might think, why is it all so cramped up? Any guesses? There's this line here. I'm sure you can't read it, but it says regulation line. What do you think that might be? Flooding. Flooding. Yep, so if we go back to this. Remember here there's a creek? to the north, or basically a drain. So there is a flood line where basically what, will, what you see when you look at planning schemes and the like is they won't allow you to build beneath the flood line. So he's prepared the plans in consultation with the town planner, town planner and surveyors. He's pre prepared his plans for the um, proposal based on the constraints on the development of the land. So he's not proposing anything beneath the flood line. So these are the 10 units. There's got, they've got some courtyards, um, but no buildings beneath that. And here's a couple of plans of what's proposed. So, you know, architect's plans. Uh, so that's, yeah, the plan down and then elevation. So two stories. And from the side, side elevation. Now here's an artist's impression or the architect's impression of what the development will look like from the street. And here's his buildings. And these are the neighbouring houses. So when I saw this artist's impression, I was like, yoo we're going to win. Because I was involved in an appeal where I was acting for Peter and there were the surrounding neighbours hated the, you know, if you try and do development in a low density residential area, so housing area, neighbours hate that, they want to keep it as houses and so there had been an objection and they had appealed to the Planning and Environment Court so, that, so I became involved at that stage and when I saw this picture I thought fantastic we're going to win this. Uh, so the key thing to note with this is, I'll just go back to the plan, so what he's done, so that image is looking in from the road. So there's a driveway and basically all of the units come off the driveway but essentially they're all tucked behind. So from the road you actually don't see a lot of the development. It's all sort of tucked behind the, fr the front units. And do you agree that it looks pretty similar to the surrounding houses from the street? Everyone happy with that? as a proposition. So that's going to be a big deal because what we'll find is that the planning scheme allows development of this size land as multi-unit dwellings is what they're called in a low density residential area but the development has to be consistent with the residential amenity of the area. So it was, it's important that the development looks like that and looks like surrounding houses because if he was proposing a 50 storey skyscraper on this block it would still be um, you would have a lot more problems because it's completely inconsistent with the residential character. But the way that he designed it, 
it, act, it was multi-unit dwellings, so it wasn't low density residential, but it's arguably consistent, I think strongly arguably consistent with the low density residential character. Okay, so that's our problem. So Peter's come to us and said, I want to do this development. So our broad, broad question is, okay, does the proposed development comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to make it comply? So can he, as a landholder, can he just go in and build that, you know, knock down the houses and build that multi-unit dwelling? Can he do that as of right? No government approvals required. Would he be in breach of the law if he did that? So to answer that question, you actually need to look at the law and you need to understand how the system works and you need to understand the planning framework. So let's just unpack that question with some subsidiary questions. So first off, what laws regulate this activity? And then where do I find the law and how do I interpret it? So can I just say as an aside, as a broad summary, there's three basic rules for complying with environmental regulation in Queensland. So first off, you have to obtain and comply with any necessary licence or government approval. Second, you have to comply with any relevant standard imposed by the law, including taking reasonable and practical measures to prevent or minimise environmental harm. That's called the General Environmental Duty. And we'll look at that in a few lectures time when we look at the Environmental Protection Act. But just like when you're driving a car, you've got a duty under the common law to take reasonable care that you don't hit someone. And if you're you know, looking at your phone and not watching where you're going and you run over a pedestrian on a zebra crossing, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, and not only at common law, you'd no doubt be criminally liable for that sort of negligence. But essentially the concept of negligence built around reasonable care, it's a standard that the law imposes when you're doing something inherently dangerous, like driving a car. You have to take reasonable care. So those sorts of standards are also found in environmental regulation. And then thirdly, uh, the least observed of them, but still a, um, worth mentioning, if unlawful material or serious environmental harm occurs, you're supposed to notify the Queensland Government. Again, that's, we'll talk about that under the Environmental Protection Act. The first one is the easiest to state, but the hardest to do, because to obtain and comply with any necessary licence or government approval, first you have to know or be able to identify what approvals you need and there's a lot of laws out there with a lot of approval systems in it. So I gave you this uh, on a handout last week. Remember we talked about the four layers, so international law, national laws, state laws, including local governments within that state level system because under the Planning Act at a state level, local governments create planning schemes and, and it's operating at a state level. And then the common law beneath that, uh, including principles like negligence and for land use, things like nuis nuisance, private nuisance and trespass and those sorts of things. So they're all part of our legal system. In this lecture, I want to focus on the Planning Act. So the way I've structured that diagram that you got last week is each of the layers, all of the bits of main bits of legislation in each level are just listed in alphabetical order. I did that deliberately. They're not in any sort of priority order. They're just in alphabetical order. I did that deliberately because I wanted to try and avoid categories. So this is just a structure. And last week I talked about building up or problem solving based on a jigsaw approach. You've got to identify the relevant bits and uh, the same development in different locations or done by different people and possibly at different times might attract different bits. So there's no simple answer to what approvals do you need that will always apply. You actually have to think about it and, uh, and know the system to be able to answer that question. So we're going to focus on the Planning Act because it's one of the most complex um, aspects of the whole system. I also mentioned last week I gave you a hand about, handout with glossaries, uh, sorry, a handout that was a glossary. So I'm using terms like law uh, and that broadly includes all acts of parliament, so legislation as well as the common law, so judge-made law, so that principle I talked about before about negligence, when you're driving your car, there is a common law duty that you have uh, to take reasonable care not to injure other people. So, uh, you know, if you're speeding, looking at your phone, not watching where you're going, you're negligent. And if you hit someone, you will be liable for the damage you cause. So that's under the common law. Um, but most environmental regulation is legislation based, so it's made in acts of parliament. So I'll use the word act 
statute or legislation interchangeably. They're just basically synonyms. Uh, so it's a law made by parliament. And so in Queensland, we've got our state parliament and then at a national level, we've got a federal parliament. So they can both make laws. Um, when it's being made, it's typically called a bill. And when it becomes law, it becomes an act. So that glossary, I'm not going to, I'm just going to move on from, you know, those sort of basic terms. Uh, if there's any terms that you're struggling with that I'm just using, then have a look at that. And if it, you don't find it there, have a talk with me or put up your hand. Okay, now, a key thing is that the laws change regularly. You might think, oh, the law is static. It's like, you know, written in stone, never changes. And that's completely wrong. The law is constantly changing. So acts of parliament are constantly being amended, uh, sometimes to improve them, sometimes you just scratch your head and think, who the hell came up with this? This is just worse than it was before. Um, so in the past 20 years, there have been four major reforms in planning law in Queensland. So uh, there's actually five bits of legislation listed there. So there was the Local Government, planning, Local Government Act in 1936 was the first general bit of planning. You can look back and you can see historical articles. There were earlier bits of piecemeal planning legislation. But the Local Government Act had a couple of sections about the development of land and requiring assessment of it from a local government. Then in 1990, a new specific planning act was passed called the Local Government, in brackets, Planning and Environment Act. That was repealed in 1997 by the Integrated Planning Act, or IPA. Uh, then that was repealed and replaced um, by the Sustainable Planning Act in 2009. And again, that was repealed and replaced by the Planning Act 2016. So we've currently got the Planning Act 2016. You might think, oh great, I don't need to know about those earlier ones. And again, uh, that's wrong. The earlier ones are sort of still there in the background because planning laws never really go away. They, if you think about it, I sort of describe it as each new bit of planning legislation doesn't sweep away the old and bring in some whole new regime. It's more like a cake where you add an extra layer so that you actually, when you're working, you need to understand all of the sort of layers. We're going to focus on the Planning Act because that's you know, where 90% of the, you know, your problems will be now if you're starting work you know, now or in the next few years. But the old bits of legislation are still there in the background because you will regularly deal with old approvals or old planning schemes and you have to interpret what those mean and you have to then understand the concepts under the legislation at the time that they were made. So the, the concepts have changed and particularly the Integrated Planning Act ushered in this focus on performance-based planning and outcomes. So the idea was, and, and in it, there used to be under the local government regime, there were zones and things were prohibited. And then in IPA, in 1997, I, I had just graduated and I was starting work uh, in the Department of Environment up in Townsville when this came in. And we were just so confused by it because it was this new regime that had come in. And basically, my view was we had these people from the Department of Planning come and give us a whirlwind tour about how great IPA was and it was going to be the best thing since sliced bread and all our problems would be magically solved. And I just think that they were living in, they were on some really exotic drugs because there was no way that that system was not incredibly complicated. It sort of came in, I call them the planning zealots, with no, no real offence intended for planners, but these people that actually don't live in the real world that think planning is this perfect regime that you've got all of the available knowledge and everything is perfect and you've got the outcomes all specified in a planning scheme. And the reality is there's lots of gaps in knowledge. There's lots of things that are confusing. So the outcomes-based planning also was brought in with a, a system that uh, local governments could not prohibit any development. So their basic idea was there's nothing you can prohibit. You have to basically provide performance criteria and the like that things will be assessed against and the outcomes are what's important. So in theory, you could put in a residential area, you could put a quarry like a, or a concrete batching plant, you know, a really noisy industrial thing if you could put a bubble around it and keep all noise and dust in that quarry or you know concrete batching plant and no noise and dust escaped 
to the surrounding houses and the trucks, you know, there was like a tunnel that, you know, they disappeared and didn't create any traffic in your surrounding streets, then you could put that otherwise, you know, bad development in the middle of a residential area because the outcomes were being met. In the real world, that doesn't work at all. You know, you don't have a magic bubble that you can keep around things. And so the, ref the, the prohibition on local governments prohibiting anything was really problematic. And basically, the, we've still got outcomes-based planning, but the whole regime has changed back a lot to allow local governments and the state government to prohibit things. So for instance, in a residential area, you simply might have prohibited um, some incompatible use. So the whole system has sort of moved around in the last 20 years and it makes it actually really complicated to look at old plans and old regimes because the terminology has changed. So yeah, think of the planning system a bit like a cake. The old pieces are there underneath, um, but we're going to focus on the planning act um, for you know, our course uh, and you'll work out you know, the other things in practice. Okay, so next off, where do we find the law? So at a Commonwealth level, there's a great website, legislation.gov.au, which is the Federal Register of Legislation. So use the official websites if you're looking at legislation. And at a Queensland level, we've got a fantastic website, the um, Office of Parliamentary Council Managers, so legislation.qld.gov.au. So uh, that's a fantastic website. I'm going to click on it and we'll look at the Planning Act in a moment. I'll show you where to find it. Um, but I want to unpack a few things first. Okay, so if you go onto that and you've got a bit of legislation like the Planning Act, then your question is, well, how do you interpret it? How do you read it? How do you make sense of it? And you'll find there's a whole heap of, if you look, at, look up the term statutory interpretation, you find a whole heap of books on it um, that lawyers um, like. And I like this sort of as, a, as an analogy. So to anyone without legal training, the interpretation of statutes can seem like black magic. The answers seem to come from lawyers burning incense and chanting, abracadabra. And lawyers can fuel this feeling of legal inadequacy, inadequacy and mystique, saying dismissively to a non-lawyer, look, that's a legal matter, you know, so shut up and, you know, let me deal with it is basically what they're telling you and treating statutory interpretation like some secret business that outsiders cannot participate in. And textbooks and statutory interpretation in Australia, oh, sorry, I'll just go back to that. So I, yeah, I really hate lawyers like that. I just think it's really um, bad form, but it's really common to see um, lawyers treat others as not being able to look at the law. And I just think that that's really wrong because uh, a lot of statutory interpretation is done by everyday people and it doesn't typically require legal knowledge to do it. All you have to do is basically be able to find it and read it and interpret it logically. So textbooks uh, on statutory interpretation in Australia and elsewhere and introductory law books focus on many technical complex rules and decisions of appellate courts in complex cases. and this can really seem like an impenetrable thicket to non-lawyers in, in understanding and applying the law. I want to take a different approach with you. So thinking that statutory interpretation is something mysterious and that only lawyers can do is largely a misunderstanding of the basics of how to do it. The vast majority, the vast majority of statutory interpretation requires little more than the abilities and willingness to do three things locate and read often large documents. Second, follow cross-references within them. And thirdly, think logically about what they say. So if you can do, do those three things, you're prepared to you know, download the Planning Act and read it and follow the cross-references through it, you can interpret and solve a lot of legal problems. If you're prepared to look at a planning scheme and read it and follow the cross-references in it, then you can interpret a planning scheme. And what I want to help you with in this course is getting over the sort of aversion to, oh gosh, this is an 800 page document. Uh, I can't possibly read all that, it's too complicated. So I've got a few, what would you call it, hacks or 
you know, simple ways forward. And they've given you this handout. I've got a few more down the front if anyone hasn't got it. But essentially, there's core skills for statutory interpretation. So I've given you a handout with this on it. So there's three basic things you've got to do. You've got to find the statute in force at the time relevant to your problem and any related document. Second, if you're unfamiliar with the statute, including in the term statute, um, regulations, planning schemes and approvals, I'm going to refer to them all as statutes for this, for simplicity here. So find them. So if we're looking at the development application that Peter Tornabini is proposing, then we've got to know about the Planning Act and then we've also got to know about, say, the Brisbane City Planning Scheme, which is created under the Planning Act. So those are two relevant things that we'll need to find as the first step. Then if you're unfamiliar with them, skim read them and any related documents and identify the parts relevant to your problem. And that should cut out the vast bulk of the text. So you go from having an 800 page document to like three pages that are relevant to solving your problem. And it's that third step then, interpret the parts of the statute and related documents relevant to your problem according to their plain meaning, having regard to the objects of the statute and context. So that third step is you know, where you're actually solving the problem, but you can't get to the third step unless you can do the first two. Find the law and then identify the relevant bits and then focus on the relevant bits to solve the problem. Okay, I want to really emphasise that most statutory interpretation is not done by lawyers and courts. And this table looks complicated. I prepared it a few years ago to really bring home the point that most planning work is actually done not by lawyers, so most statutory interpretation. So this was a table of development applications and planning appeals in 2008 and 2009 across Australia. So in the first column you see we've got Queensland, then New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, Western Australia, ACT, Northern Territory and the total. So let's just focus on Queensland. In Queensland in that year there was 23,000 development applications. So over 10,000 in Brisbane City Council alone. So Brisbane City Council and Gold Coast get the bulk and Sunshine Coast now a lot as well. Most of the other councils don't get anywhere near those numbers. So 23,000 in total. So most of those are prepared by planners and assessed by planners and lawyers don't get involved. Of that, there was 591 planning appeals that year to the Planning and Environment Court. So that's brought it down to 2%. So typically there will be lawyers involved in that, but that's 2%. And then of that, most, often people appeal to the Planning and Environment Court basically for negotiations. Like if you're, a if you're a developer and you're unhappy with the cost of some conditions, you will appeal against the conditions and then negotiate with council to you know, find some middle ground. And most appeals are resolved by consent when the parties come to an agreement about how to resolve it. So about 80% of planning appeals are worked out by consent between the parties. Only in that year, only 96 cases went on to um, contested decisions by the Planning Environment Court. And about 100 is a typical number for the P&E Court. And of that, in that year, the next level of appeal is to the Queensland Court of Appeal. There was only 10 planning appeals that year. And there were no, above that, there's um, special leave applications and appeals to the High Court, which is our highest level of court. There were no planning appeals that year to the High Court. And then if you look down, those numbers are pretty consistent across Australia. So 250,000 planning applications across Australia. I mean, New South Wales and Victoria and South Australia have got you know, this massive number of them. But by the time you get down to their appeals and the like, it's all pretty well come down to similar numbers and similar percentages as Queensland. And none of them had appeals to the High Court. So in most planning textbooks, you will see um, focus on sort of appellate level decisions and the complex questions that go at an appellate level. And my thought is it's completely wrong. It would be completely wrong for me to talk with you about those sorts of problems because they are, they're like a, you know, the unicorn um, that you know, it sprints through the door, very, very rare. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right analogy. My little girls would love it, a unicorn to bolt through the door, but I'm, I'm meaning that they're um, very rare. Um, 
the vast bulk of applications don't involve any lawyers at all. They're involved, they involve planners and other consultants preparing them, doing statutory interpretation, preparing an application, and then they go to councils and they're typically assessed by planners and others, engineers, working in council without lawyers being involved. So the vast bulk of them don't involve lawyers. And they're actually pretty simple. Most, most of the complexity is around factual issues. It's not the law. You know, you will work out, okay, yes, we know what that is. We know what you're proposing. We're unhappy with the stormwater management of it and we want you to change your stormwater management plan or, you know, some aspects of it, the factual issues or council wants uh, the developer to pay for some road upgrade and that's really expensive. So there's a fight over whether that's required or not. But the actual legal issues often most applications aren't complicated legally. Okay, just for background, uh, we'll come back to this in our second last lecture when we look at courts, but in we've got a state court system and the main court for planning matters is called the Planning and Environment Court. And above that we've got the Queensland Court of Appeal and above that we've got the High Court. We've got a federal court system as well, which here's federal matters, so cases about the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, but in the planning world, the p and &E court, as it's often called, is you know, the most important court. Don't want to dwell on that. And lawyers you know, get dressed up. Um, we wear wigs because we don't have any hair. No, not quite. Um, so um, barristers in our jurisdiction still wear wigs and gowns to contested decisions, typically. Often they'll just be in a black suit. I actually haven't got my jacket, but I, you know, so. Mostly if you go into court, you'll see a whole heap of people dressed in black um, suits, um, like if you go to a call over or something like that. Um, and in trials, uh, often barristers will, will wear a wig and gown. Um, but what I really want to emphasise to you is you can do a lot of statutory interpretation and the vast bulk of problem solving is done by people with just your backgrounds and just your skills. You don't need to be a lawyer to do that. So anyway, that's some data. It's from an article I wrote back in 2016 called Myth Drives Australian Government Attack on Standing and Environmental Lawfare in the Environmental and Planning Law Journal. And it was based on data from a local and planning minister's council report. Okay, so that's background to say a lot of statutory interpretation is really simple. And what I want you to be able to do at the end of this course is do that simple level. I described our course is a bit like legal first aid. You won't be able to do, you know, like open heart surgery at the end of our course. Like, just like if you did a first aid course, you wouldn't be able to do open heart surgery. So there are complicated questions that, you know, you won't be able to solve, legal questions, but the vast bulk of things you'll be able to do with um, these three key steps. So step one is find the law in force at the time relevant to your question and any related documents. So let's do that. So when I say related documents, um, for us with Peter Tornabini, there's the Planning Act, the planning regulations, which we'll look at more next week in the context of the development assessment system, but also documents like planning schemes. So these are all related documents. So to solve our problem, we actually need to understand all of those documents and how they work together. So. Um, the next step is skim reader, but I, what I want to do first is go to that website and just talk to you about it. So, because I think it's a really val valuable skill if at the end of this course you feel comfortable actually going and looking up a bit of legislation. I don't, you know, because the law changes all the time, there's no point me, or it would be stupid, that's the right word, stupid but commonly done, to try and jam a lot of, you know, section numbers and rules in your heads for you to regurgitate to me in the exam. And I just think that that's so useless because the law is changing all the time. If you can remember all those things today, if the law changes tomorrow, you need, you need to get used to going and looking up the current version of the law or finding the version in force at the time relevant to your problem. So yeah, that first step is find the law in force at the time relevant to your problem. So if you're dealing with, say, an offence from 2015, then you have to go and look up the law that was in force in 2015. You can do that on this website. So 
looking at this website, see here it's got enforced legislation. So generally, you know, if you're dealing with the problem in the present day, you can just use that and it will give you the most recent version. But you can also look at acts as past um, and the legislation in force does some pretty cool things. So it's basically like a library. So in force legislation, acts and subordinate legislation, um, P, because we're looking for the Planning Act, and then it'll give you a list. Um, we just go down, it's just in alphabetical order. So the Planning Act, I click through to it, and it gives, to, it, gives it to you in a, a HTML version, which is okay, uh, but I, and just look up here, see so you've got, you can look at the subordinate legislation, just click on that and it will tell you what's beneath this. So the planning regulation is beneath it. And you can also look at um, history notes, um, but the most useful, I suggest, is actually the PDF versions, because I, at least, this is what I do. Click on the PDF version, so it's the most recent version. If we, if we wanted to look at one, an historic version, because we're dealing with a problem from last year, we could find the historic version on that page. But here, I've just clicked on the most recent version, and then what um, I do is, uh, I, I really recommend, uh, you get used to if you don't already, um, buy yourself a 27 inch screen, so that the pages will look about A4 size, maybe even two, so you know, a lot of people work with two screens so that you can have you know, two documents open and be you know, on one screen you've got the document you're working on and on the, another screen you've got the legislation you're looking at and you move between those two. Um, but if you've only got one screen, make it a decent screen. You know, don't look at it on your phone or whatever because you'll, um, it's far more useful, I think, to um, view it. I always go page display, two page view, and then um, the electronic bookmarks on the side. So if you've got a screen that's big enough, that's basically an A4 size, then there's no need to print it out. And you don't want to print any of the stuff out because it's like 400 pages, 343 pages long. So, and it could change tomorrow. So if you, you, know, you print out a version, you bind it, and you go to all of that trouble apart from the tree you just killed, it's useless and in fact it's dangerous because if you keep taking this along to meetings and looking at it all the time thinking it's the current law, you really need to get used to just going to the website, getting the version in force at, at the time relevant to your problem, doing that first step because it is just a minefield if you're using old versions of the law, not checking. So um, get used to using the PDFs, download them, have a decent screen and then a key thing I would say to you is the table of contents is your friend. Get used to using it because the next step in terms of skim reading, uh, the table of contents is basically what you can use once you, you, know, you get used to legislation to identify the relevant bits. So, and basically there's cross references all around. So let's work through that for this. So our problem, so let's go, so we've, um, Finding the law relevant to our problem. So I'm going to look at the planning scheme in a little while, but let's focus on the act. So our question, we, we've got Peter Tornabini, and he wants to develop his land, and we're asking, does he need any approvals? Now, basically, unless there is a penalty for him for not getting an approval, most developers will just say, oh, stuff it. Um, you know, uh, Unless there is some big fine, a lot of people would just develop their land. Um, because you know, if you could build a 50 story skyscraper on your land and um, no, there was no penalty for doing it and that was gonna be worth you know, $100 million to you or you keep it as a house and you, know, you sell it for a million, well, virtually everyone is gonna develop it for that you know, massive skyscraper. So if it was just unregulated development, we'd have a whole hodgepodge. So the legal system is built around penalties for breaching the law. So when we're asking, do we need approval, what we're really asking is not like, what was it, the sports minister who had the guidelines for the sports grants? Um, now the law might be, you know, this um, at a federal level, there's this big sports rorts um, saga with the, before the last federal election, the 
now government basically used public money to buy votes by basically targeting marginal seats in their own seats to give out money for sporting facilities. And the minister had like a colour-coded spreadsheet identifying the seats by, and there's this big you know, stink at a federal level. So um, the law, so, so she has said, oh, well, we only breach guidelines and, you know, they're all eligible, so there's no law was broken was the claim. But, I mean, the law might be, you know, there's laws against corruption, so um, obtaining a benefit by deception. So um, on the face of it, what she's done might look like corruption, um, in which case she could be liable to go to jail. Um, but if it's only guidelines and there's no penalty, well, too bad, you know, it's all politics. The federal government, you know, she's moved on and there's no real penalty for them other than sort of public relations disaster. So the same with the planning system. If there's no penalty, then basically people would just run amok. So the planning system is built around some big penalties for doing, carrying out development that you don't have approval for if it gets over a certain threshold. So let's look for some penalties. Um, so we can go through the Act and you might just want to write down, if you've got a page, let's just write down some headings. So get used to using the table of contents and, write, and get used to looking at the structure and what we want to do is get rid of 90% of the legislation and just identify what's relevant. So where are there penalties that require us to do something is what we're looking for. So we start looking through the Act Chapter one is all this preliminary stuff, purpose of the act, the like. Um, ecological sustainability is a big concept and balance and all of that sort of stuff. So, but that we find that there's no penalties in that chapter one. We, we read, read through it, no penalties. Chapter two um, talks about planning and you can click on it and go through it. And basically it creates frameworks with related documents like um, ministerial guidelines for planning schemes to be prepared, state planning, planning policies, it's where planning things can be created, but there's no penalties there if you do development and you don't have an approval or something like that. So we could skim through that and we find it's not relevant to us, to Peter. It would be relevant if we were a local government and we wanted to prepare a new planning scheme, but it's not relevant to our problem. So here we are, we're up to, um, page 55 already, chapter three, we've identified that all of everything in the first 50 pages is, is not relevant to us. Um, chapter three is about um, development assessment and that creates the process, if you need an approval, the process that you have to go through. But we could go through that and we find there's no penalties for not um, going through it in chapter three. So that's not relevant to our initial problem of, you know, are there any penalties? We go through, and look at chapter four, and now we're up to page 130. <clears throat> it talks about infrastructure. Again, we find there's no penalties and it's not relevant. We're not proposing infrastructure we're, or infrastructure charges. We are proposing um, a unit development. We find there's no penalties there. The whole of chapter four is irrelevant to, to answering our problem. Then chapter five, okay, so this is looking much more relevant. Offenses and enforcement. So we could start reading here and we find offences like section 163, a person must not carry out accessible development unless all necessary development permits are in effect for the development. And there's a maximum penalty, if you go over the page, of 4,500, sorry, I might just change this back to, I know I like to work with, um, I'm going to, pause in a moment. I just want to just complete this section and then we'll take a, a break. Uh, making this bigger. Okay, so probably a lot more legible up the back. So um, section 163 says a person must not carry out accessible development unless all necessary development permits are in effect for the development. And then makes it a penalty if it's a heritage place, 17,000 penalty units, if not 4,500 penalty units. So uh, there's another act called the Penalties and Sentences Act, which basically states a penalty unit is worth $110 at the moment. And it's, when it's changed, like if they raise it to $120, all the offences across the whole of Queensland, all of the statutes that refer to um, penalties 
all basically increase automatically. So that's, we use penalty units to deal with things like inflation simply. So penalty unit is currently worth $110. So 4,500 penalty units by 100 for an individual, if it's not a heritage place, is a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, if it's a corporation, you multiply that by five as well. So you're starting to talk millions of dollars for carrying out accessible development unless you've got an approval. So hey, this picks up our interest. Uh, this is a potential offence. So what are the elements of this, do you think? Like what's, what's, is this relevant to us? So a person. Is Peter a person? Yep, so um, person is also defined to include corporations as well. So if it was, you know, the developer was his private company, then he would also, that company would also um, be a person must not carry out accessible development. So what does accessible development mean? So here's the first of our cross-references. So basically get used to moving to the dictionary. So see down here in Schedule 2, at the end there's typically a dictionary of defined terms. So basically you have to read sections and then look at the dictionary for defined terms. What I often do, if I've got a hard copy, like if it's a particularly important section, I often will go and put in red exclamation marks around the terms that are defined so that I know the, th the things that are defined, so you have to read them with reference to the definitions. So, uh, and they're just in alphabetical order. So, accessible development, C section 44, subsection 3. Okay, so another cross reference. So, we were at 100 in section 63, we've gone to the end of the act, now we're going back to 44, which is, happens to be back in, the, in chapter 3. Um, and there it defines um, categorizing is instruments and the categories of development. There are three categories of development, namely prohibited, accessible, or accepted development. And basically, we'd follow those definitions. Those are things that are identified in categorizing instruments, which is basically, it's a terrible term that they've chosen for this act. It's meant to be a simpler, sorry, that was the Greek version. Um, <laughs> it's meant to be a simplification, and they chose some really horrible, clunky terms. Categorizing instruments basically means any government plan that's recognized under this act. They call them categorizing instruments, but basically those things identify what is um, prohibited, accessible, and accepted development. So for our purposes, we're going to go and look at the planning scheme because that's one of the key places that you find uh, those categories of development. So basically, if something is, for our purposes, we'll look next week at the regulations because that's another big source of categories, but at a state level, but at a local government level, all the, all the things that require approval from, this, from the local government are identified in the planning scheme. So let's take a, a break and come back and we'll um, just finish off this little bit of statutory interpretation and then we'll move on to look at the planning scheme. Cool? Okay, so should we say five minutes for, for a break or ten minutes? What do, you, what do you guys feel like? Five minutes? Cool. Okay. I'll see you back in five minutes. So let's start back. Before the break, we're, we're looking at this problem for our client, Peter Tornabini. He wants to develop uh, some house blocks at Northgate. He's got two houses and he wants to put units up. And he's, he's asking, does he need any approval, basically? Uh, what we've done is go and find the Planning Act and we've downloaded it and worked through it very much as I would do in, on a day-to-day -day level and you guys need to be able to do as well in, you know, in, in the workforce. So use the government website Get used to finding the relevant um, bit of legislation. It varies depending on you know, the, the time frame that you're looking at, but typically it'll be the current version that you look at like we did. Get used to downloading the PDF, get a big screen, open it up, get used to moving around in it and uh, going from the dictionary, looking at the sections. And if you can follow that chain, follow the cross-references and basically cut out most of the other stuff that's irrelevant to your problem, then you go from having hundreds of pages of documents to read to only a few pages. 
so no one picks up, you know, like the Planning Act and sits in bed with it like a novel and reads it from page one and says, oh, okay, this is an interesting story. It, the, the, you don't use these documents like that. The same with the planning scheme. You don't just read them from the start. You basically use hacks to find the relevant bits and then focus on them and follow the cross-references around. So it's how you have to work through this legislation. There's no, often there's no other way to do it than the hard work of actually picking it up and reading it and spending the time to follow the cross-references. The good news is that it becomes easier as you go. So the first few times you do it, uh, it seems like, well, there's so much here, and then you get used to it. And for instance, if you are, say, working in a consultancy in Brisbane, you get really used to the Brisbane City Planning Scheme, the um, Brisbane City Plan 2014. And you will often probably get to know relevant parts of it quite well. So you might be able to, to, to identify, because you've done a previous project looking at low density residential and units, you already know about it. So you can, instead of spending, you know, five hours working out what the law is, you already know it. So as you go on through your careers, you become faster at doing it and you pick up knowledge. But whenever you're in a new area or, you know, there's been some change to the um, planning scheme or the legislation, you basically need to be rechecking those things and doing it as of course. Otherwise, basically your career is like walking through a minefield. You don't know when things are going to explode. If you don't do the basics well, you will step on mines and they will go off. And yeah, people will sue you for being negligent or something like that and you don't want that. Okay, so the key things you need to do um, faced with the problem is find the law in force at the time relevant to your question and any related documents. So we're looking at the problem now. So we've looked at the current Planning Act. We don't have to worry about the earlier legislation. We're just looking at this bit of legislation. We've identified that there is an offence in section 163 if it's accessible development. And we've identified that planning schemes uh, is one of the categorising instruments that will tell us if what we're proposing to do is accessible development or not. So we found all these relevant bits. The, the Act, um, we're not looking at the regulations, as I said, this week. We'll look at the next week. That's the state level assessment triggers. The local government level assessment is uh, far more detailed and typically far more important for most developments, so the planning scheme. We've skim read the Act, so we use the table of contents. Remember, the table of contents is your friend. Get used to using it, get used to moving around, looking at the dictionary and going back. You know, if there's a, a critical section, you might print out that one page and, you know, highlight bits, put some notes on it, but don't print out the whole thing. Um, otherwise, you know, it's just a trap. Um, so you can do that um, and, you know, there is the structure in the Act, but can I just give you a suggested structure to think about this in a bit more at a conceptual level? So. A conceptual structure of the Act is like this, and it's pretty well, this is the same structure for, I'd suggest, pretty well any planning legislation anywhere in the world. So if you're from Peru or China or wherever you're from, any planning system is going to have a similar sort of structure. So you've got some sort of objective of what you're trying to achieve with the system. So here we call that ecological sustainability. That's dealt with in Chapter 1 of this Act. But then there's basically two big limbs to any planning system. On one side, there's the the plans, the government plans, of basically what they want in particular areas. So, you know, the, the government will identify, okay, in this area we want industrial development, in this area we want residential, over here is an airport, uh, over here is a port and a major industrial area for heavy industry. And so those plans are basically what the government does. And then so that's one, if you imagine it as one arm of this system, and the other arm is the development assessment system. So if you're going to have a plan, then you've got to have some way of assessing applications. So if someone is in an area that is a residential area and they want to build a factory, for instance, how do they go about getting approval? Or in our case, they're in a residential area, but how do they go about getting approval for units? Can they do it? So that's the whole development assessment system and they work as two arms of the same system. Now linking them in the middle, because as I said, land is worth so much money. If you didn't put a big penalty on non-compliance with the plan, people would just run amok and you'd have skyscrapers and a whole heap of stuff going on all over the place. So you need to have some regulation 
that basically puts a penalty if people breach it because the reality is if you stand between um, most corporations and 10 million or 100 million dollars they're going to shoot you and walk over you to get at their 100 million bucks um, so you need to have some big cannons in your arsenal if you are the government and you want to basically restrain big developers with you know potentially hundreds of millions or billions of dollars worth of development they will fire a hell of a lot of you know, legal salvos, salvos at you, they will do what they want unless you've got enough machinery to stop them. So that's the offence forces enforcement and dispute resolution provision. So that's chapters five to six. So yeah, I should have said planning is chapter two, development assessment is chapters three to four. It's basically the glue that holds those two bits together is the offence system. Because if you don't have offences associated with it, there's so much money to be made in development you know, if you don't have offences, your whole planning system will just be ignored. And then underneath it is this repeal and transitional provisions, which sounds really boring, but is often critical because regularly you're dealing with old, you know, like we've got this new act um, in uh, 2016, but we are looking at a planning scheme that was created in 2014. So the Brisbane City Plan was created in 2014 under the old legislation that had different concepts. And so the repeal and transitional provisions are critical to be able to use documents from different eras in the planning system in different parts of the system. So it sounds really boring, but in practice it's really important. And I'd suggest that those five parts are going to be, you're going to pretty well find them in any uh, advanced, uh, that's the wrong word, any um, real planning system. You know, if you don't have those parts, then it's going to be, a, you know, the system probably isn't going to work. So wherever you go in the world, I'd suggest you'll find those parts in some form. Okay, so we have been through um, interpret the relevant parts according to their plain meaning. So we actually followed this through when I was looking at the PDF. So we went, we found 163. So that's an offence um, for carrying out accessible development. We went to the dictionary to look up what was accessible development. That sent us back to section 44, and that um, basically told us uh, as defined in planning schemes effectively or the regulations. Can I just mention there's an optional fourth step which I've put on the back of your handout, which is to search for court decisions applying the statute. You guys don't have to do that. Me as a lawyer, I would go and do that, but you don't have to do it because most things you will work out just from reading the legislation. And going and looking for court decisions is a whole different world of complexity with the different levels of court, how they've been applied, what the judges said. Typically also with court decisions, you pretty well get the answer that the legislation said anyway. So, you know, like if your question was, um, you know, do we need an approval for to carry out this development and you go and find a court case that says you need approval if you're carrying out accessible development, well, that's what the legislation said to you anyway. So you don't need to go and look for um, court decisions. I just mentioned it to you. There's a great um, website called Ostley that you can look for past decisions, but you guys don't need to do it for the purposes of our course. You may want to do it in practice. You know, there'll be some reference to some court case that's useful. I've referred to in your handout to a few cases like Ashvan, which is a recent decision of the PE Court I'll talk about next week as well. Okay, can I just also add, as I put on the handout, recognise your limits for problems involving statutory interpretation. Um, just as you wouldn't attempt open heart surgery after doing a first aid course, you don't have to do everything and think you can do everything related to the law. What I'd like you to be comfortable with is doing the basic sort of stuff like we've just done, picking up the planning scheme and reading it. And then once you've followed the cross-references, if you're still confused about it, you know, you can talk with your manager at work uh, and they will probably be scratching their head as well um, if you can't work it out. And what I suggest to you is basically use a rule of thumb that um, most things you'll be able to work out, but if you're unsure and it's a big deal for your client, like there's a lot of money involved or there's high risks, then basically, you know, advise your client to get some legal advice on, on something like that. But most things you won't need legal advice from, most things you will be able to solve yourself. But basically what I want to say to you is, there should be a little red, red flag that pops up in your head when 
you're feeling uncomfortable and you're not sure and there's big risks involved. Uh, so that little red flag is really valuable, listen to it. And if you're unsure of something and you've read it two or three times and you still can't work it out, ask someone. If they can't give you a clear answer and it's a risk for your client, then you know, I would be flagging that, documenting it, saying, you know, we're not sure about this, we recommend you get advice. Uh, those are the sorts of things you do to avoid um, claims of negligence. Okay, so we've dealt with what laws regulate this activity. Let's move on to are any applications needed to gain government approval? So we've looked at the Planning Act, um, but I want to focus now on the planning scheme. So I just mentioned, just in passing, about tenures. So a lot of applications vary depending on your tenure, and tenure and ownership is really important for regulating land development as well. So private land, or freehold land as we call it in our system, is only about 20% of Queensland. Most Queensland is still owned by the government. Um, private or freehold land has been sold by the government. So most land in Brisbane that's privately owned is freehold land. But like where we are going out to um, Darling, the Darling Downs, I'd expect most of that is leasehold. So it's owned by the government but leased by landholders. And Often, you know, pastoralists, they regard it as their land. Uh, they, they don't really see any difference between freehold and their ownership, um, but it is actually a different legal um, ownership regime. So um, we're dealing with freehold land here. So in a city like Brisbane, most private land is freehold. Okay, talked about the conceptual structure. Can I just emphasize that in the planning system, there's a range of layers. Um, so there's a statewide, regional plans, so state planning policies, um, regional plans, and then local um, planning schemes. But the, possibly you might think it's odd, but the, with decreasing geographic area of application, you basically dramatically increase the levels of detail and specificity. So you might think statewide is gonna be the most important, but for most development, it's actually the local level that's the most important because that's where all the detail is. Particularly in Brisbane and the Gold Coast, the planning schemes are really long and complex. Why do you think they're long and complex in Brisbane and the Gold Coast and not say if you go out to Mount Isa or you know, some of the um, large rural shires? Why do you think they're so complex in Brisbane? And Gold Coast is like multi-volume, yep. A lot more stakeholders. You're close, they get a lot more development pressure. So, and basically the land is so valuable and they've got so much pressure that if you, they, what they try and do is put a lot of detail in the planning scheme so it's all there and that's what they can assess against and there's limited discretion because they, if it comes to discretion, they know that developers can appeal to the Planning Environment Court and they'll end up with a whole heap more appeals. So they try and put it all in black and white in the planning scheme to basically have a reference document because there's so much development pressure. That's why the documents are so big and complex. So, <clears throat> yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a wide range of approaches to environmental laws and plans. Increasingly prescriptive and detailed laws and plans have the advantage of giving certainty to landholders and the government, but the disadvantage of being long and complex, whereas shorter, less prescriptive laws and plans tend to be very vague and uncertain in their operation, often tending uh, often depend to a large extent on discretion. So discretion might sound attractive, but if you are a, say you are a proponent and uh, the, the, the only test was whether the application is in the public interest, whether you'll approve it or not, and it's gonna cost you half a million dollars to prepare your application with all of the surveyors and all of that. You, before you make that investment decision, you actually wanna know whether you're gonna be approved or not. So if it's just a vague sort of black box government decision if they like you, um, but you don't actually know what they're gonna like, then that's actually really problematic. So you as a developer, it's actually useful to have a detailed planning scheme because if you write your application to meet the planning scheme, you're likely to get approved. And that's valuable because then you can make your investment decision to spend half a million dollars in all of the expert reports and the like, and it's gonna be a worthwhile investment. So discretion sounds attractive, but often in practice becomes really problematic. So our system has been roundly criticized for decades for its complexity. And 
I sort of throw my hands in the air often when I hear that. The, the reality is planning is very complex. It's big, there's millions of people trying to do millions of activities every day, often on different scales of space and time. Some activities might only go for a day, some might go for a month, some might go for decades. They have different levels of impacts. You've got this incredibly complex situation you're trying to regulate. The system that actually regulates it is actually going to be complex and factually complex. But every government says, oh, the planning system's too bloody complicated and um, brings in a new regime. So Labor in 2016 brought a new, new regime. Um, so previously the act and regulations were, I don't know, a thousand pages long. Now they're only 700 pages long. Uh, basically what they did to reduce a lot of the complexity was shove it in subsidiary documents like ministerial guidelines and the like. So we've still got the same basic complicated system. It's just that they've taken a lot of the provisions and shoved them into subsidiary documents to say, aha, we've got a shorter act. It's only 340 pages long now instead of 700 pages long. But a lot of that has basically disappeared into subsidiary documents, like ministerial guidelines that I'll talk about next week. Planning regulations, 475 pages long, 24 schedules. So multiple layers. Um, there's ministerial guidelines, 88 pages for um, making ministers' guidelines and rules, um, for making um, planning schemes. And there's a state planning policy provides for state interest to be incorporated. That's 88 pages. Uh, then, basically, the development assessment system follows Chapter 3, linked to the DA rules, so the development assessment rules. So in our group assignment, we'll be looking at the DA rules. So they're 38 pages. Uh, and then the regulation itself is 475 pages, and that puts the state-level triggers, and that's linked to the state development assessment provisions, which are 260 pages long. So see what I'm saying about there's these big documents you have to get used to using the table of contents and what you need to do is find the relevant parts. So you go from having like 2,000 pages to only having maybe 10 or 20 pages that are really relevant to your problem. And regional plans um, are important in describing an urban footprint. So back a couple of decades ago, there was a real concern that Brisbane and the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast were all gonna merge because of urban sprawl. So they, the government over 10 years ago created a regional plan to try and stop them from merging. And there's under it's what's called an urban footprint. So basically, if um, you're carrying out urban development in southeast Queensland, you've got to be in the urban footprint. So for our problem, Peter Tornabini, oh, sorry, and then um, planning schemes provide the bulk of detailed provisions. So in Brisbane, so Peter's land is in Brisbane, so we've got to look at the planning scheme. Um, there's a whole heap of useful resources um, on the state government um, website, so the DSDMIP, so the Department of State Development, um, still MIP? Mine? No, it's not mines. Um, infrastructure and planning. Um, Basically, state government and, and federal government departments change their names all the time. Um, so it's not even going to tell us what the... Anyway, it's planning, DSD, MIP. Um, they change their names all the time, um, so it's a bit of a moving feast. So anyway, it's a useful website, huge amount of information there. We'll be looking at it in shoots and you know, using it um, as part of the group assignment. It also has links to all the different local government websites. So uh, on the local government websites, you'll find their planning schemes. So everything's online. Yeah, huge amount of useful resources, maps. So for the, um, there's a DA assessment mapping system, which basically covers most of the state level um, triggers. So things like the urban footprint, you can find there. So again, you can do a search. So let's just say for Peter Tornabini's land, we, we know there's a regional plan and basically it says uh, you can carry out urban development in the, basically in the urban footprint. So basically you want to be in the pink because that's the area under the regional plan that is the urban footprint. So basically you can do a search for the lot and plan, go onto the um, uh, website for the DA mapping system at a state level, do a search for the plan, 
and basically this is what you find. I just I won't actually go online. I just click through um, screen grabs of what you'd see. You can do a search for one of the lots, um, zoom in, and basically good news for our client. We're in the pink. So because what we're proposing is urban development. It's multi-unit dwelling. So we're not proposing industry or agriculture or anything. We're proposing an urban development. So we've got to be in the pink. We are. So if you actually zoomed all in on it. Um, the lot numbers have now changed because the development was actually has been carried out um, and I'll show you the images of it in a moment but basically that's the block of land at a state level and it you can look at things like coastal hazard areas and the like there's all these different layers and overlays you can click on and view so um, very useful resource there at a state government level then um, let's have a look at the local government planning scheme because as I said while state and regional planning is important the local government planning schemes provide the bulk of laws and regulation regulations restricting land development in Queensland and other Australian states so that's where most of the detail is so basically we know we're in the pink so tick for the regional plan um, don't need to look at any more um, move on so we go into the planning scheme and we find there's a lot of um, uh, provisions around um, our land and a lot of restrictions. So planning schemes are statutory instruments under the Planning Act. You interpret them according to the same basic rules that I've given you. And uh, they've they, again, they change over time. So there was a Brisbane City Plan 2000, which is when I was dealing with this for Peter, um, we were dealing with this planning scheme. And it had a similar structure to the new planning scheme. There's a strategic plan. Under the legislation at the time, the Integrated Planning Act, everyone moved away from calling things zones. So back in 2000, they called them areas, but they're basically zones. So they're this basically a planning designation that allows you to put similar activities in similar areas. So residential zones, industrial zones and the like. And then local plans for like an area like that you might want to, in a geographic location, um, manage um, a, a range of different zones in a particular way and then um, codes and planning scheme policies, a range of other parts of the planning scheme. So now we've got the Brisbane City Plan and again you can go onto the website and we're going to do that in this week's shoots. Go on and look at the BCC website for the childcare centre that we're going to for the field trip if you're coming on that today. We're looking at um, the BCC website, we'll look at what's called PD Online and look at some real documents. Um, so again, you use the same core skills working through a planning scheme. And can I just emphasize to you, like um, I've given you a handout on this as well. Basically the key hack that I'd give you for planning schemes is that they're always a combination of maps and text. So the way that you get through them quickly is that you use the maps to identify the relevant parts of the text. Can I just explain that? So again, no one goes and you know takes a planning scheme to bed to read it, you know, from cover to cover. When you're actually working with them, what you really want to know is okay, which parts are relevant? And the key thing to that is, you know, what is the land designated as? So you use the maps to then identify the relevant parts of the text. So yeah, use the maps to identify the, the land, how the land you're considering is designated. And then once you've got that information, you can then go and read the relevant parts of the text. Can I just unpack that a bit? So look at the maps. So this is from the Brisbane City Plan 2000 and all the different areas. If I just zoom in, again, you can go to PD Online, the Brisbane City Council um, website, put in the lot and plan like we will do for the childcare centre. And you um, can zoom in. And our land is here. So I've actually given you that screen grab in your handout. Um, so that's our land. And again, it just happens to be pink. Pink, there are, as you can see, there are more colours than pink in, um, in plans. Um, but then you can look at the legend and you would find the pink is the low-density residential area. The green is... Um, yeah, it's a park. Um, sometimes the colours can be difficult to um, tell exactly what it is. 
uh, and there's many sort of subcategories and you can typically just click on the, the property and get a specific property report. So it'll tell you in text what is the zone. But for our land, it's in the low density residential zone. Um, the purple is industrial. So, um, so that was, oh, sorry, this was the city plan 2000. And I just wanted to point out that it hasn't really changed under the city plan 2014. So our land is still in the low density residential. It's still in the pink, light pink. Um, and there's still industrial over the river or over the creek. So, sorry, that, and that's a screen grab I've given you on the, um, on the handout. But the key thing I want you to think about with that handout is shown in this image. So I've given this to you on a handout. So on the top I've put a, a grab from um, Nearmap, um, so a, a better version of sort of Google Earth. So. Um, but basically, like Google Earth, it shows you the reality of what's um, there on the ground from the air. And then underneath, I've got the same sliver of Brisbane, but shown as it is in the zones. And can you see here that in reality, see there's this all obviously industrial, we talked about this at the start of the lecture. And then on the, um, in the planning scheme, it's also designated as industrial land. And over here, what's shown as residential, or what is residential, is also designated under the planning scheme as low-density residential. And the thing I want to emphasise to you that planning schemes do two things. At the same time, they, they reflect his, the historic reality of land development. So it reflects that, you know, those industrial areas were developed decades ago. The planning scheme showing them as industrial reflects the historic reality of what they are. Similarly, in the residential area, they're designated as residential, but that reflects you know, decades of development. But they don't just reflect the historic reality. They also constrain the future reality because in the industrial area, for instance, you'd be prohibited from t developing sort of a residential development because it's typically seen as incompatible with, you know, you know, you're just creating a whole problem for the council if you allow a residential in the middle of a really noisy industrial area, there'll be a whole heap of complaints. Similarly, in the residential area, you'd be constrained from developing an industrial development in that area. So planning schemes both reflect historic reality to this point, as well as constraining the future reality of what can be developed in the area. And so, I'd just like you to think about that. If you haven't thought about planning schemes before, you know, particularly if you're not um, a town planner, think about this, and we'll also talk about it on the field trip, how there's the historic reality as well as constraining the future. So it's not just a colourful plan, it actually has legal effect and reflects reality. So looking at the maps, we can identify that the land is in the low density residential zone and now we can use this information. Uh, it's key information to identify the relevant parts of the text to read. So basically, again, on PD Online, you can go and click on, on the website and, and in the planning scheme, knowing that it is low density residential, you can then go and read the text on low density residential and um, it gives you categories of development for a material change of use, and I'll talk about these terms more next week in development assessment. But basically, um, in a low density residential zone, if you want to do a um, dwelling house, it's accepted development, provided you comply with um, the relevant housing codes. So you don't need approval, provided you comply with the codes, what used to be called self-accessible development. But if you went through that whole table, you find nothing about multi-unit dwellings, which is what we're proposing, units. And then at the end, there's what I typically call the bucket. It's basically, it says, anything that we haven't specifically made a lower category, we make accessible development and, and impact accessible, which means there has to be public notification and there's appeal rights. So, um, so you go through this table, and if your development isn't listed there, then you fall into the bucket at the end. And planners use that technique to avoid, you know, someone coming along and proposing, like if you just had a list of things that you thought would logically occur in the area and you didn't have the bucket in the end, 
then you leave yourself open to someone coming along and proposing a spaceport, you know, or some crazy thing that you never thought of. Um, but you know, if it's not shown as being accessible, then you know, can you just build a spaceport if you want to? Because no one thought of it. Um, well, you couldn't because it wouldn't be one of the things that are particularly taken out, and it falls into the other categories. So we look at the text and we find, does the proposed development require assessment? The answer is yes, because we're proposing a material change of use for um, multi-unit dwellings, and that is made under the planning scheme to be accessible development and impact accessible. Then next, we look at the text to answer our question, is the proposed development likely to be approved? And you probably can't see this up the back, but basically in a low density residential zone, because you might be thinking, units, what have they got to do in a residential zone? Well, in Brisbane, in the low density residential zones, development other than a dwelling house, uh, including dual occupancy or multiple dwelling, um, is not accommodated within this um, suburban setting unless on well located site over 3,000 square metres. And then also the overall outcomes are that the development has to be of a form and scale that basically is consistent with the low density residential living. So those are two key things in the planning scheme. We have to have a site that's over 3,000 square metres and it has to be consistent with the low density residential amenity. So. Um, it was actually similar back in 2000 when, um, or 2009 when I was dealing with it. The 3,000 square metres was under the old, that, that scale or that requirement. If you had land over 3,000 square, square metres in low density residential, then you can have a multi-unit dwelling. That's pretty big because most house blocks are about 450 square metres or around about that. So, you know, that's, um, well, let's just round up, you know, six, let's just say, 500 square metres for a house block, you know, that's, you'd have to have six houses, six normal house blocks in Brisbane before you could turn them into units or multi-unit, multi-unit dwelling. So here for Peter, um, he's got two blocks and I'm sure you can't read the numbers, but basically one block is 1,723 square metres and one is 2,228. So he's got land that's nearly 4,000 square metres. So he gets over the threshold of when you can have multi-unit dwellings in a low density residential area. He meets that, what are now called assessment benchmarks. And um, even though that all his development is basically on half of that land, you can use the total amount to, you know, to get over the 3,000 square metres. And I showed you this to start with, the artist's impression. So he's kept it at a scale and it's in a location, because it's all tucked behind, that's consistent with the low density residential amenity of the area. So he's not proposing a 50 storey skyscraper, which wouldn't get up. It would just be inconsistent with the planning scheme. He's proposing something that's consistent with the local, the low density residential area. So he meets that assessment benchmark as well. So basically, um, the key test for development approvals is this, and again, I'll deal with this in more detail next week, but basically, uh, and I've put this on your handout, if a proposed development is consistent with the planning scheme and other layers of government planning, it's likely to be approved. So if what you're proposing is consistent with what the government plans say, then it's likely that you will get an approval for it. And conversely, if it's not consistent with the planning scheme and other layers of government planning, it's likely to be refused unless there's sufficient reasons to justify it. And basically, you can be inconsistent in many ways, some small, some huge. Basically, the bigger the inconsistency, the harder it is to get approval. So you, you might have like a height limit of um, 12 metres. And because of the lie of the land with an awning, you know, your building might be 12.1 metres. You know, that's like 10 centimetres. Okay, that's a minor inconsistency with the, the assessment benchmarks and the planning scheme, as opposed to like a, you know, a 100 metre story skyscraper, which would be, you know, they're, they're both um, breaching the height limit, but one is by 10 centimetres and one, by is, one is by, you know, a huge, you know, 90 metres or something. And, and so you can be inconsistent in different ways. The bigger the inconsistency, the harder it is to get approval. Okay, so, yeah, I've just used that example. Um, I've, again, I've given this to you on your handout. Um, two stories, if a planning scheme sets 
two storeys as the height limit, then an application for two storeys is likely to get approved, but an application for 100 storeys is likely to be refused. So the planning scheme is the reference point. So to answer our problem, and, and just wrapping up now, um, does the proposed development comply with the law, and if not, what steps need to be taken to make it comply? Well, we've learned that we need an approval, because it's accessible development, but the good news is for Peter that what he's proposing is consistent with the planning scheme. You know, there's more detail there that we could dive into, but I've pulled out some key parts for you. It's basically consistent with the planning scheme and he's likely to get approval. So postscript, um, what happened? So it got approved back in 2009, and this is what the land looked like in 2009. And then in 2011, the, the building's been cleared. Um, 2011 in June, you can see the footpads coming down of the development. Then July, buildings coming up. Um, November, roofs on. Um, May 2012, it's basically built and operational. 2014, you know, back to you know everything's grown back. And then just this was the last image on um, near map. Um, that was good. Basically, this is just last year. It's all there. It's been there for a decade. And if I just um, come down to street level. So this is the street view in 2013 and then this is the street view um, in 2018. So basically the trees grown up. So that's what it actually looks like from the street. This is what they said it would look like. Can you see the similarity? So that's what it actually looks like. This is what they said it would look like. So consistent with the residential amenity of the area. Okay, um, can I just wrap up, mention field trip. So today uh, field trip, we're going to walk around the childcare centre, only be about 40 minutes. We're going to talk about this site in the um, shoots this week. So basically, if you want to come, we're just meeting just outside this building, uh, opposite the UQ Chancellor's Place bus stop. We're just going to meet on that little bit of land opposite the... And we're going to meet at 1 o'clock, and we'll only be about 40 minutes. Just going to walk around the childcare centre. Um, for field trip two, uh, if you want to come, can you register and um, I'm sorry that the school makes you pay for buses. Fought against that in the past and had no luck. They say either you basically impose the cost or don't have a field trip, so I choose to have the field trip. Um, but basically, can you sign up if you want to come on the field trip um, so we can basically work out whether we need two buses or three. I'm expecting there'll be about 100 people, um, but I'm you know, not booking four buses for 200 people because there won't be that number. Okay, just to wrap up, a last couple of slides. Um, go onto the website, download the Planning Act, and just click around to it. Just have a look at that website is what I'd like you to do. In the tutorial, we're going to look at the Brisbane City Plan and play around with PD Online. Okay, so take home points. You can find the law online, and three basic rules will solve 95% of your legal questions. Two, planning schemes provide the majority of detailed controls on land development and the comprise of maps and text that you need to read together. Three, if a proposed development is consistent with the planning scheme and other government plans, it's likely to be approved. And fourthly, if it's not consistent, it's likely to be refused unless you've got sufficient reasons to justify it. Thanks everyone. That's the lecture for this week. I'll see you in shoots. <laughs>